So, hello everybody. I'm Lucas, Lucas Perron. I'm the founder and uh, director of the international research platform SIM and welcome to the fifth session of the symposium. First time we do a morning session, at least here in Brussels, it's morning. I'm not alone here at Beaux-Arts, at the Art Center. Raphael Bonnoyer and Amber de Munch are with me. It's thanks to the Beaux-Arts team that we can uh, make this online symposium possible. Today's session is a second of uh, two sessions during which we, we focus on research, which tries to come to a better understanding of uh, intercultural music programs. And founding president of the SIM platform, John Sloboda, chaired last week's session. And today's session is chaired by Bridie Lee Bartlett, who just became the new president of, of SIM. After the short 10, present, 10 minute presentations of the three research projects we selected for today, Bridie will first chair a panel discussion. And the scholars in the panel are from Australia and the UK, but they're developing research in, in not only in those countries, but also in Norway, Afghanistan, Sri Lanka, and Kosovo. Following the, the panel discussion, I will be able to propose some of your questions um, to, to them, to the panel. And as you can read in the chat, your camera and audio, audio have been muted and will continue to be muted throughout the session. If you have questions uh, for the Q&A, please use the Q&A button down, down below your screen, not, not the chat button. Your, your questions will only be visible for the speakers and moderators, not for the other attendees. I will be back later on. But before giving her the floor, let me first introduce you shortly to Bridie, Bridie Barclay. Besides being one of the co-founders and now president of the research platform SIN, Bridie is director of the Brisbane-based uh, Queensland Conservatory Research Centre, which is part of the Griffith University in Australia. Bridie and I are now editing a special sim issue of Musica e Scienziae, which is expected to be published in, in September this year. Bridie, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Lucas. And it is such a, a great pleasure to be chairing this session today. I send my warm greetings to all of you and I hope that you're going okay. I'm mindful that many of our panelists are currently in lockdown and I'm mindful that many of the audience members might be finding themselves in very challenging circumstances. And so I send my very best and heartfelt wishes to you all. And I hope that this session that we have today might provide a momentary pause. It might give you some inspiration and possibly some hope. And so I send my warmest greetings under these challenging circumstances to you all. Now in Australia, we have an important custom that we do at the start of any important gathering or event. We acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands upon which we are gathered. And here in Australia, it's the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples who have been the custodians of our country for over 60,000 years. We pay our respects to elders and we recognize the significance of their cultural knowledge and their ongoing stewardship of the land upon which we are meeting. So in keeping with this Australian custom, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands upon which I'm zooming from tonight, Brisbane on Jagara and, Euro, uh, Jagara and Turubu country and to pay my respect to elders past, present and emerging. And I also acknowledge the elders and the custodians of the many lands from which we are Zooming tonight. And I think because of the intercultural focus of tonight, or this morning, I should say, uh, this session, I thought it would be really fitting to begin with that custom. So today's session, as Lucas mentioned, looks at socially engaged music practices from across a really wide range of contexts and intercultural contexts in particular, from the COVID pandemic to war affected sites and migrant perinatal settings. And knowing the very high caliber of all of the speakers, you're certainly in for a treat. 
As Lucas mentioned, we're going to have three presentations, which I'm sure are going to be very thought provoking. So do put your questions to paper. And then we're gonna have a broader panel discussion about some of the macro themes that have emerged from those presentations, followed by a Q&A. And then we're gonna be sent off with a wonderful musical experience as well. So without further ado, it's my very great pleasure to introduce the first of our presentations. And this has been co-authored by a stellar team of scholars, Professor Jane Davidson, Dr. Alexander Crook, Dr. Mariko Hara, and Trisna Sari Fraser, all from the University of Melbourne, and Professor Tia Denora from the University of Exeter in the UK. Now, of course, given our short timeline, we've only given them 10 minutes. Alex is going to do the honours and present on behalf of the team and their topic is certainly very timely in this COVID landscape. Fractured bonds and intersectional capital, the impact of social distancing on artists' social networks. So very, very welcome to Alex. Over to you. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Bridie. Um, and I'd like to also start by acknowledging um, that I'm Zooming from the lands of the Wurundjeri and Boon people, and I'd like to pay my respects um, to Elders past, present and emerging, and any other Elders that we might have with us today. Um, so unfortunately, uh, Mariko cannot join me for, uh, for this. She's on the Zoom, but um, for technical reasons, I'm going to do my best to do justice to her part of the presentation as well. Um, so thank you all for joining us online. Um, the presentation is uh, based on, let me share the screen first. There we go. Okay. So this presentation is based on research from a larger project called Social Cohesion and Community Resilience Through Inter Intercultural Music Engagement. And this was originally conceived with the aim of investigating intercultural music engagement that supports intercultural understanding. Um, and in response to the worldwide COVID-19 crisis, we've investigated the impact of social distancing on community musicians' social networks. Um, this was done through online interviews with musicians in three different countries. And today we'll, we'll present some of those findings. So in this presentation, we will explore the lived experiences of community musicians who suddenly had to shift their practices to online spaces in response to strict COVID-19 social distancing measures. Um, and also what happens to community music in terms of its format, musical affordances and other aspects of the community, oh, sorry, when uh, the communities themselves are physically dispersed. So we conducted uh, structured, semi-structured Zoom interviews with seven community musicians in Australia, two in the US and seven in Norway. Uh, initial informants were chosen purposively through the researchers' personal networks and additional informants were enrolled through snowball sampling. All musicians were involved in intercultural music engagement, um, which we're defining as a process each in which one engages with, with a culture different from their own through music. We used thematic analysis uh, to analyze the data. Um, and the data was first uh, analyzed by one researcher inductively and the other researcher used the themes to code deductively. So the most striking sub theme that emerged was the fact that musicians' primary social networks that their pre-COVID music engagement was based around were fractured due to these social distancing measures. Uh, so Buba is a percussionist in, uh, from Senegal, currently based in Australia, and he expressed how tough it was that he was suddenly not allowed to meet other band members. For him, music requires a location to play together. And Faisal, who is a percussionist from Syria, currently based in the US, said the biggest impact of social distancing was the ability to play and get together with other musicians and friends. Like Buba and Faisal, most other informants also emphasized that being unable to meet with fellow musicians meant, meant being disconnected from one's primary social networks. Participants' networks were also affected by issues beyond purely physical restrictions. For example, some participants acknowledged that even when connection was maintained via online tools, it did not fulfill the same social roles as pre-COVID. For instance, Mitzi, who teaches African dance in Australia, said how doing Zoom uh, classes made some students actually feel more isolated. So this fracturing also resulted in loss of employment, income and professional opportunities, uh, lack of social support on a personal level, which in some cases led to mental health issues. Um, so it was all around kind of looking bad from that perspective. However, 
As their primary phys uh, physical social networks fractured, musicians developed networks in online spaces uh, and included individual efforts such as exploring new opportunities online, streaming concerts from their living rooms, running online courses, making themselves more visible online, learning to use new software or hardware, and also online collaborations. There are also organized group efforts, uh, for instance, by venues or live music, um, for live music, who arranged and promoted streamed online concerts, both from musicians' homes and from live venues. Um, and there was also some other support made uh, to help profile, uh, artists raise their profiles, um, given the, the COVID-19 um, pandemic. So these developments actually uh, brought uh, some opportunities, but also a lot of challenges. So how did community musicians continue their work with a community that had become physically separated? So Sarita is an Indian uh, classical musician based in Australia. Her approach was rather ad hoc. For uh, instance, um, she would just turn on Facebook Live when she was playing the sitar or sitting with the violin, even though she didn't really know who was listening, but she hoped that her music reached the audiences who were going through a lot uh, during the pandemic. Uh, Kwame is a multi-instrumentalist and vocalist from Ivory Coast based in Norway currently. So he runs an online drumming course and the number of students actually increased during the pandemic. He explained that he connects with his students from all over the world through social media feedback functions and told about how encouraging it is to connect with his students via, the, uh, via these functions. Um, okay, so... Uh, in the findings so far, we've seen, hopefully you've seen uh, that networks and connection emerged as really central themes. So we decided to use social capital as a key analytical lens um, in looking at this data, data further. Um, we did this because it highlights how different social networks facilitate belonging and trust. Um, and also because it had been used previously in the literature. And specifically, we're focusing on Putnam's version of bonding and bridging capital. Bonding with the close networks um, that facilitate trust, uh, shared un, uh, sense of purpose, and bridging capital, which is extended networks um, which, with less trust, but the idea that you can uh, gain new information and ideas. Um, so we applied these uh, concepts to our data to explore community musicians, social and musical networks during the COVID-19 crisis. And what we found was that bonding networks and associated capital were fractured suddenly and immediately almost across the board. To compensate, musicians typically developed online networks, um, which will often emerge spontaneously and were larger and more varied than their offline networks. They also included people from different regions who had more varied aesthetic priorities. And we found that bridging capital emerged from these online networks and helped to create new opportunities for community musicians, such as Corona collaborations, as uh, one participant described them. Participants also explored new ways of community musicking in online spaces. A great example of this is Dr. Elliot Gann's Global Beat Cipher. I think there's a link to that um, being shown at some stage. Um, and they also found to, um, to explore their and develop their own musicianship. And in doing so, often developed new musical connections with dispersed communities. For example, Kwame developed bridging capital by accessing new students through hosting online courses. He then appeared to bond with certain students and then mobilized this bonding capital through streaming concerts. So we can see here this almost, we can see uh, a cycle here happening of capital. And we can also see that the connections uh, were actually often quite hard to categorize as either solely bonding or bridging because often they included elements of both, appeared to be continuously developing, or seemed largely dependent on individual or subjective experiences. So we felt existing types of capital were insufficient. Therefore, we would now like to propose new two, two new types of capital, um, but with a caveat that we are, these are under development and we'd love to get some feedback on them. So the first one is hybrid capital. A good example um, is Kwame's cycle before, but there are many descriptions which included elements of both bridging and bonding uh, capital simultaneously. And then there's intersectional capital, which is the idea that what one gets out of engagement in a certain space depends on their identity and intention. So for example, Elliot suggested that those who attended his global beat cipher but did not identify with hip hop had a very different experience of connection from those who did. Similarly, um, uh, Mitzi's normal classes almost fell over, but her over 60s um, women's classes were absolutely booming. 
So um, now, uh, this last quote here is to illustrate the sense that we got from all participants that no matter what the conditions, community musicians are gonna find ways of doing what they do, connecting with others through music. So that also brings me uh, to our conclusion that despite hardships associated with social distancing, our studies suggest that new forms of community musicking and music related connections emerged during the COVID-19 period. And we argue that further research is necessary to further to, uh, explore the potential of community musicking in online spaces to inform theory, policy and practice. And that's it from us, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alex. And we can all give a clap, even though it might not quite be heard. Um, that was a fantastic presentation and congratulations to you and your, your wonderful team of co-authors, Mariko um, in Norway, but also Jane and Tia and um, Trisna Sari, thank you. That's been a great way to open up the space for thinking about these sim related topics in a COVID landscape. And I think an incredibly timely topic um, that many of the musicians uh, and researchers who are in the audience right now can certainly relate to. I think your, your core themes of network and connection are probably going to reappear in some of the other presentations that we're about to hear, but you've certainly given us some food for thought about extending social capital, bridging capital and bonding capital towards hybrid capital and intersectional capital. So I'm sure there might well be some questions about that in the Q&A. So thank you. Great. It's thank now you. my great <laughs> thank you, Alex, and thanks to the team. It's now my great pleasure to introduce my dear colleague and friend, uh, Dr. Gillian Howe, who is also uh, coming from the University of Melbourne in Wiradjuri country, and she's going to be presenting her paper entitled "The Many Pieces," spelled P-E-A-C-E-S of community-based music making, drawing on her work from Kosovo and Sri Lanka. So over to you, Gillian. Thanks so much, Bridie. Um, and hello, good evening and good morning, everybody. I'm speaking to you from the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Eastern Kulin Nation. Um, and I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. And I live and work on land that was never ceded, which is really important to acknowledge. So I'm speaking tonight, as Bridie said, about peace. And let me just share my screen. Okay. So for many people, peace is what you have in the absence of war. In peace studies, this is something that's known as negative peace. It's opposite. Positive peace goes further. It's as being a peace that addresses the structural injustices and inequities that fuel conflict. But in between these two are many real world variations of peaceful living, giving us many pieces rather than just one universal concept of peace. Understanding these varieties of peace and how they are produced in music activities, as well as in the wider environment, is, I propose, a useful step in researching music and peace building and developing effective practices. And today I'm sharing two examples of uh, examples of two varieties of peace that emerged in music activities to illustrate how this can work. The first example comes from Sri Lanka. So 25 years of war between the Sinhala Buddhist dominated Sri Lankan government and the Tamil insurgents in the north and east of the country ended in 2009 through extreme and decisive military action. The civil war left the population fractured and divided linguistically, geographically and socially, and with their music sector badly damaged. When the Norwegian government decided to support the revival and strengthening of traditional folk music practices across the island, it did so in the hope that this would also support the, the country's people to reconcile. So one of the flagship projects of the Sri Lanka Norway Music Cooperation was an annual music festival that was held in the north or the south of the island in alternate years. It brought together performers from Sri Lanka's diverse folk traditions to share and celebrate and revive these practices. In 2016, I was researching the, the reconciliation outcomes of the Sri Lankan Norway Music Cooperation and was a participant observer on a drumming collaboration between two all female drumming and dance ensembles. One was a Sinhalese drumming ensemble from the Performing Arts Acad Academy in Colombo and the other was a Tamil group from the war affected North. 
And the artistic goal was to present a drum and dance performance that would combine the Sinhalese and Tamil traditions and showcase young women's artistry. The two groups hadn't met or worked together before. They rehearsed for two days in Colombo before traveling south to Gaul for the festival. As I observed the activities, I was struck by how unequal the two groups seemed to be. The musical composition they were preparing was already in the Colombo group's repertoire. For this collaboration, they created a pause about two thirds of the way through and the Tamil group's music was inserted at this point. There was then a finale section that they created on the floor under the direction of the Colombo group's director. The Tamil drummers had creative agency over their own component of the collaboration, but seemed to have little voice in shaping the collaboration overall. Authority remained with the Colombo group's artistic director who was a respected performer and also male. The rehearsal space was the Colombo group's home base and much of the performance time and physical space was occupied by the Sinhalese drummers. Language barriers between the two groups exacerbated the challenges and further reduced opportunities for collaborative decisions. The festival had provided a translator, but she took quite a passive role and only really provided translation when she was asked to. And so it wasn't really present um, as a translator for any of the incidental discussions that took place. Through all of these interactions, the piece that was projected by the project was one in which authority and overall authorship remained with the Sinhalese group. They welcomed and made space for the Tamil group, but into a work that already existed, that was already to some extent complete. And it also struck me as an outsider that this variety of piece mirrored the asymmetry between Tamil and Sinhalese people in post-war Sri Lankan society. Sri Lankan's piece is often described as a victor's piece, where the victorious party, which in this case was the Sri Lankan government, conquers territory and people, winning control of the cultural and the political environment and the public narratives of the conflict. In the drumming collaboration, there was a cascading set of musical and logistical decisions that kept the Sinhalese group as the authority and effectively welcomed the Tamil drum drummers into their territory, but rather than designating it as terrain that they could somehow remake and inhabit together as equals. And given that this kind of asymmetry was at the heart of the grievances that sowed the seeds for civil war in the first place back in the 1970s and 80s and even before that, we can imagine that many Tamil people might have found it difficult to reconcile this variety of peace with their own visions of peace. A second example comes from the Balkans. And this one's been prompted in part by my current research into the ways that community music may support inclusion and connection among youth in Kosovo and Northern Macedonia, but it also collect, connects to previous projects I've researched in the city of Mostar in Bosnia-Herzegovina. Two of the settings are divided cities, that is urban settings where the population is predominantly ethnically segregated down either side of a de facto border, such as a river or a road and where media and public goods and services are all delivered in parallel, meaning that they're essentially doubled on either side of the boundary line. Ethnic identity then becomes a major factor in, in daily life that determines where you go and what you do and who you meet, creating grounds for all kinds of indirect violence, discrimination and social controls. In any case, in divided cities, there are few possibilities for the two populations to meet and interact, work together or build relationships. Now the projects that I'm interested in don't necessarily label their work as peace building for reasons that I can elaborate on in the Q&A, but they share a common interest to address the divisions caused by the conflict and create spaces in which connection and peace can grow. In my research, I've been paying attention to what happens when the wider nationalist political conflict enters the musical space. Participants tell me that they're not interested in politics. They see the continued division as a stubborn legacy of the past that older generations and a patriotic minority are attached to. They like the fact that when they enter this musical space, everyone steers clear of political or nationalistic subject matters. Indeed, some speak of this as a rule that allows them to relax and brings other aspects of their identity into the foreground, like their music identities. But occasionally someone breaches this rule and says something or posts something on social media that brings the nationalist politics into the space. In my observations, this kind of transgression results in the departure of someone, either the person who transgressed or someone who was disturbed by the transgression and drifts away when it isn't addressed sufficiently. This suggests that the peace that is being created isn't necessarily one that has the tools to deal with the conflict head on. Now, this might sound like an insufficient variety of peace, but some pieces work obliquely. In fact, the piece in these music projects has strong alignment with the concept of everyday peace, 
a piece that tends to prevail in settings where there's an entrenched division and where local people have limited capacity to change the political status quo. Everyday peace describes a set of mutually agreed reciprocal social practices that people adopt in order to get through everyday life without conflict in a politically tense environment. These practices include avoiding contentious topics or can be systems of manners or deferring blame for the continuation of the conflict to outsiders or outliers. It's a very pragmatic, it's often very nuanced and, and skilled way of interacting across divisions, but it's not necessarily equipped to transform conflict. Rather, it reduces its likelihood so that people can move through their day free of direct conflict, whether this is out there in the life of the wider community or in the community that forms within the music project. So I think we'd all agree that peace is a social impact of music making that we'd like to encourage. But why might applying a varieties of peace lens be a useful step? Firstly, it's a tool for bringing clarity to the work of using music to build peace. Being able to offer a clear vision for the type of peace the music activities will build or contribute towards and articulating the parameters of this can be an important factor in retaining local legitimacy, as well as ensuring a shared vision among any external collaborators. Second, the analysis of varieties of peace can help to bring the stated intentions and actual practices of a project into alignment. For example, a project may have emancipatory goals towards a justice oriented peace, and that's what they'll describe the work as, but a varieties of peace lens might reveal that aspects of its practices are reproducing some broader social inequities. Third, the lens can bring insights about the wider terrain into which the music project sits. Often it's in the wider socio-political context that determines which varieties of peace will be possible. Recognizing the limitations of what can be achieved when and by whom is an important aspect of program design as well as evaluation. And fourth, varieties of peace in music making may be connected to particular music practices and pedagogies and how they work in different conflicted contexts. Studying pieces and practices in tandem will help to strengthen community music practices and the design and delivery of music interventions in conflict affected settings. And that is the overarching goal of my research. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gillian. And I can just imagine the virtual applause, which is resounding across the world. We have 66 people joining us on this call right now, and I'm sure everyone has really enjoyed your presentation. Like the first paper, Gillian, this is such a timely topic if we look around the world at the enormous divisions and conflict and fractious identity politics that pervade so many different contexts. I think there's a lot in your paper that has, has such relevance for thinking about the many varieties of peace. So you've given us great nuance and complexity in terms of grappling with that, um, that big P word. So thank you, Gillian. As um, you might have imagined, if you look in the chat, you'll be seeing all sorts of links posted from our fantastic organizing team so that you can follow up on some of the projects and also the people you're hearing from. So do check those out. We're now moving to our final presentation before we get into the panel discussion. And if you can imagine a map of Australia, we're traveling up the East Coast where it gets a little bit warmer. We're heading to Brisbane and Jagera Turrbal country. And it's my great pleasure to introduce my close colleague, Dr. Charulata Mani and she's from the Queensland Conservatorium Research Centre at Griffith University and she will be presenting on a topic called Connect for Comfort, Lullabies in a Culturally and Linguistically Diverse Context. So over to you, Charu. Thank you, Bridie. Um, it's so lovely to see you all um, here this evening and I've just started my timer so I don't go over time. Um, yeah. So I'll be talking um, about Sing to Connect, a program that really connects us. But before that, I'd like to acknowledge my connection to the country on which I stand and speak. I pay my respects. Um, so Sing to Connect was a program um, that brought together singing and midwifery. So Griffith University represented by the Queensland Conservatorium Research Center, where I am center manager, but also associate researcher, um, teamed up with Metro South Health to um, 
to generate the synergy between two seemingly disparate disciplines. However, the bridge between us was culture and community. And the sense of community, the organization that gave us a sense of community there, the partner was Access. And the organization in the Logan area that gave us the funding to carry this out was the Logan City Council. So this was possible through a grant, uh, a community projects grant uh, from Logan City Council. And the project ran between um, May and December 2020. So this is the landing page of the website. The reason I put this slide up is it, it says a lot of things. It says what we did, we did, we, it was about research and engagement. It was about musics, cultures and motherhood, also midwifery. And it states something that we often um, know and understand as researchers in this field, seeking to make an impact on society through music. The fact that singing promotes physical, emotional and social well-being. And the fact that this project really relies on this evidence base. So we, um, we stood on the shoulders of giants in this field, in this scholarship. So the, I have just put up a few points of the project aims, partnerships and the funding just to um, have a granular look at what we did. So this initiative linked music and midwifery, particularly singing, song, language. Um, and the objective was to promote perinatal mental health and well-being of new mothers from cult backgrounds. So some of you might wonder why, you know, there, there has to be a need, there has to be a call from the community for us to, to act with and for the community. Um, but as Zygmunt Bauman said, we have to be for each other before we are with each other. Um, so the fact that we are um, wanting to help mothers from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds was very important for us, but the call came from within the community. So over the last year or two, I've been hanging out with uh, folks at Access, with culturally and linguistically diverse women. Um, being a card person myself, I, I find, I mean, I, I found comfort in going and meeting people like me, but also connecting to midwifery because at Access, there is a hub, it's called the Maternal and Child Health Hub um, at the Metro South Health. And that's where midwives meet with their clients, the women and have antenatal classes, talk about their pregnancy and help them through the processes. But the point was the midwives wanted to connect to the women from a cultural perspective. They wanted to understand the person they're working with better. Uh, and what's a better way to understand than access um, the personalities and their backgrounds and, and, their, and their beautiful vitality and vibrancy through culture. So that's where, for me, the interface between culture and midwifery and singing came, came through very strongly. And I got, and I made good friends with um, people from Metro South Health, midwifery. And so it, it all began with relationship building, a long period of relationship building and trust building. Um, and well, then the partnerships kind of um, came together quite, naturally and organically, we hadn't, we didn't force them, it happened, uh, which was beautiful. And so, um, yeah, I, I wrote a grant and we got it and Bridie had helped me with all of that. Thank you, Bridie. Um, and so our activities were over 12 weeks. We, we would have workshops every Tuesday. So Tuesdays were a fun day. So I'd get dressed, get, get in my car and drive to Logan around 40 kilometers from where I'm staying. And all these women would come and they would wear their best clothes. They'd bring their children along, five, six children, some of them, big families. And we'd all sit together, sing, talk. There'd be a whiteboard. Uh, we'd introduce some songs. They would give us some songs. Um, and they would come and correct me in the whiteboard and say, no, 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 th this is not how you write that word. This is how you write it. So then they were gaining agency, self-efficacy, confidence. Um, and many of them said, well, we are going for TAFE classes in English, but we'd love to um, learn English. So seeing those songs on the board helped them with learning English. And 
uh, midwives would sometimes talk about safe sleeping or breastfeeding or things like immunization, exercising, the placenta, the role of saving. So I kind of became quite good at understanding the, these things. Um, but what I would do, um, me and the facilitators would do is we would take notes of what's being said and we would uh, then initiate a circle where we'd write a song together on the placenta. And the women would say uh, what it means to them in their language. So it became multilingual language uh, songs that we were building in that space. It's, it's uh, I've, I've seen much work and the literature around this area talk about safe spaces for, for diverse populations to um, be and, and, and enact their lived experience. But I think this is a brave space. They not only need safe spaces, they need brave spaces. They need um, spaces where they can articulate, act out, have fun, be loud, you know. Um, and the key features, um, the core design with called women, like, like I said, we spent time, so we could co-design, we co-designed with the midwives. Uh, it was a strength-based approach because singing is a strength in each and every culture. And it was culture-centric, so the, the basis was culture. I've just outlined some of the, the top five outcomes um, for the mothers. So there was spirituality, teaching each other, feeling connected, learning about life, making friends. And to see their midwives as ordinary humans like themselves, like friendly and fun people. For the midwives, they learned about the women's cultures, families, talents, who they were as people, not just as clients and cultivated friendships. And the flipping around of power in midwifery came through strongly. And the power of non-pharmacological inventions, um, sorry, interventions uh, that are arts-based. Five dimensions came through in the analysis that I undertook with the qualitative data of um, the interviews with the women. I haven't gone into the research design very much, just an overview of what happened. I'd like to just uh, play an excerpt from the docufilm before I finish. I'm aware that time is running, so. So because we're all women from different countries and we found it really good to, um, to be singing the same song and to be all feeling the same way as women coming yeah. together. So um, how did you feel? Like one word? coming together when we, when women come together what's the feeling so we felt really good because we all feel like um, we're doing the same thing, one thing, and we have one intention. Um, I keep myself safe, I keep my baby safe, I unite, I exercise, I want to. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure to share with you. Uh, you can find some of the links here. Um, 
and it was lovely to hear the other speakers speak as well and congratulations to the team thank you thank you so much charu and once again i can hear the applause from across the world and there's been some affirmations shared in the chat so a fantastic project and if you enjoyed hearing those voices and those songs i encourage you to follow the link that's been provided in the chat and watch the really beautiful documentary which really um, gives a wonderful window into, into that project. And Tara, I loved your, your notion of not only a safe space, but a brave space. And I think this is really a lovely example of working with the cultural strengths of a community um, and creating space uh, for that to be bravely uh, shared and celebrated. So thank you for that, that wonderful presentation as well. Thank you to all of our amazing speakers. What fantastic papers with so many synergies. Uh, I hope you've been drawing the connections as I've been madly trying to in my notes here. I think the one word that everybody said was connection. Uh, not surprising that we're saying this now in the COVID landscape, but obviously something that's very uh, specific to the space that music opens up for us to, to think more about. We've not only covered some really diverse contexts from COVID to war affected spaces to perinatal settings, but I think the, the papers have also given us some really useful conceptual and theoretical lenses that we can use in sim research from intersectional capital to divergent concepts of peace to notions of social inclusion. So there's plenty of food for thought and I hope that you're saving up your questions. So while we're moving into a panel discussion now, I strongly encourage you to use the Q&A function where you can pose some questions and Lucas is gonna share those with us after we've, we've had our discussion. But before we do that, what I'd like to do now in this panel uh, conversation is to zoom out a little and to explore some of the macro themes that I think have collectively emerged in some of these presentations, but also more broadly, when you look at the scholarship of all of the presenters that we've heard from tonight. And there are some big macro themes in terms of sim research that I'm really dying to pick their brains about. So I hope that the questions I have on my mind might be of interest to those who are joining us from around the world. I'm certainly looking forward to, to hearing about them. I would also like to invite to the panel uh, some of our co-authors who didn't get an opportunity to speak before, but I'm hoping they're going to share their thoughts now. Jane Davidson, if you wanted to give us a little wave there. Um, we have Jane who's joining us from Melbourne. We also have Tia Denora, who's joining us from Exeter as well. Tia, lovely to see you joining us. We have Mariko Hara, who is joining us from Norway, has had a few internet issues that we can all very much relate to with Wi-Fi connections. So Mariko, lovely to have you on our panel as well. And Trisna Sari Fraser as well from Melbourne, lovely to have you and thanks for, for waving to us as well. Now to get the conversation going and for us to make space to think about the broader implications of these three papers for our SIM field, I want to start with the really big and obvious question um, that I'm keen to hear some of our speakers talk about. And the question is why music? <laughs> what is it about music that enables such valuable outcomes to occur in the context that we've heard about tonight? Why music? Tia, can I throw to you as a scholar who we've all read for many years with profound thoughts about why music and what is it specifically about music that enables these valuable things to happen? We'd love to hear your thoughts. Okay, thank you for asking me. <laughs> You've given me an impossible task, uh, not because the question is difficult to answer, but because I think the answer probably takes a week of constant speech. So for me, I think there are a number of things. One is the fact that music is temporal, it's moving through time. And of course, that is linked to music and embodiment. And that is in turn linked to how I think we have established in the research base that there's a kind of shared communicative musicality that is uh, uh, something that 
crosses culture and is a basis for coming together in different ways. And I thought the lullaby example was a really good one of precisely that. I'm thinking, of course, of Cole and Trevarthen's work. There's all of that, but uh, there's also, I always say when I talk to my students, it's like, if we were doing carpentry together or painting a mural together, right? We'd all be doing different parts of it at the same time. You know, I might be making the arm of the chair and you might be making the rocker of the chair. But the beautiful thing I think about music, and this is something that we see across culture, is that we can effectively all be hitting the same nail with the same hammer at the same time, you know, so that we can be in some sense of sync. Now, sync, I'll just say this is the last thing, is a really interesting question at the moment for us, given the latency problems with Zoom and so on. But one of the things that I've been working on in a different project is how we compensate for that in lots of different ways. In fact, two different projects, one with people with profound dementia where music therapy is being provided via Zoom, the other one with improvising orchestra, you know, where people are having to play together on Zoom. And what I think happens there is that music often leads the motive, the motivation to find ways of coming together otherwise. So it's undergirding that and it's something very malleable and plastic. So, you know, it's, it, it, it affords so much for us. I think that's, well, I better stop there. I could go. Yeah. Thank you for answering my impossible question in such a beautiful and succinct way, Tia. And I think the analogy of, of the, 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 the hitting of the nail together is something that, that all of us, I can see, are stewing over. And also, as you say, thinking about these implications in the COVID landscape where we're compensating in very, very different ways. Yeah. Um, Jane Davidson, I can tell um, you might want to build on what Tia has said. Would you like to add your perspectives yes, to the one? Yes, I, I was just... Yeah, for sure. I was, I agree completely with Tia. And I was also thinking about some work I've been doing historically with much older people, but also I did a similar project to your one in Queensland with Sam Diekman uh, with some lullaby choirs in Melbourne. And I think the one thing that music does give you, it's not only music, but there are certain aspects of music. It can give you this intimacy as well. There's something about the capacity to bring you so close. Um, and I'm always struck by a, a quote I had in one of my choirs, um, where really quite an elderly woman was talking about the breath of the men singing behind her and this breath touching her neck, but also the fact that they were um, metaphorically touching each other in, in this incredibly close harmony. So you have the synchrony, but that also gives you this intimacy as well. Um, so I think that's a really significant part of musicking. I'm also remembering a very strong image of where I was running a, a choir with people with dementia and there was one very elderly lady just improvising to the music and she was so absorbed and completely without a care in the world about anything else. You know, there was no anxiety, nothing. She was lost in the music. And I think that's some, that's the kind of thing, if we think of Oliver Sacks, it's a kind of rhetoric he would have used. Um, and I think they're two very strong components as well. And if I can bring us, and I don't know if Alex or Trisna want to talk about this or indeed Tia and Mariko as well. If I think about the, a space in Zoom, for instance, where those things are so compromised. And if we think about the project we were just doing and this idea of bonding, how tricky it is to bond, even though you're doing this thing, there's a problem with synchrony, which we've just pointed out, but there's also the problem of the, the intimacy as well. So, um, yeah, I don't know if either of any of those people wanted to add comment to that? Um, I'll, I'll just add a comment of um, that theories about social capital, there was a lot of theory development happening in the 1980s, for example. And I guess what we found through the research was that the idea of bonding and bridging, it's just not 
sufficient for what we're experiencing today because the world is a completely different place from the 1980s. Um, yeah. Thank you, um, Trisna Sari, and, and all the more important, um, those concepts that you were putting on the table in terms of thinking beyond those earlier forms of capital towards intersectional and hybrid capital. Um, and there's lots of, of food for, for thought for us there. Um, we could probably talk about that topic all night long, as Tia said, rightfully, we need a whole week. So I, I hope you're all ready to sit on Zoom for the next week. Um, I would certainly love to subscribe to that conversation. I want to take the, the discussion in a related but slightly different direction now and focus a little bit on ethics. Um, and this is a topic that's come up in some of the earlier symposium conversations. And it's something that certainly comes up in this broader field of socially engaged music making or so social action music or sim or whatever um, terminology you prefer. It's obviously an ethical minefield. And I'm acutely aware of the sorts of welfare like narratives that we frequently hear, not necessarily from researchers, but certainly from arts organizations um, working in this space who can all too easily slip into tropes about helping at risk communities. Um, and using these sorts of narratives in, in, in funding applications to try um, and secure funding around a particular project without too much sophisticated understanding of, of how those outcomes are going to be achieved for a start and also the ethical minefield that they're tripping themselves into. And I think that this really um, takes us into quite a problematic damage centered uh, type of, of narrative in this work. Um, and I'm thinking now of the amazing work of Jeff Baker who was featured as one of our earlier speakers in this um, series who's, who's talked about the problems of this and what that can actually mask. So my question is how we negotiate this complex ethical minefield and the ethical dynamics when doing SIM research. And Gillian, I'm going to turn to you because you certainly have walked uh, into some very complicated ethical situations. And I wonder if you can talk to us about the ways in which you've negotiated some of those and maybe some of the take home messages for those who are working in this sim field for thinking about how you negotiate ethics. Um, well, thank you for, that is, feels like it's putting me on the spot a lot because um, they are, I think for a lot of the projects that I've done, they are, it's all, there are always many questions and many challenges. Um, uh, I had a feeling when you sent out that email and said ethics that you, were, you might start with me. Um, okay. One of the things that I found to be really important in the projects that I look at is, is the amount of local ownership that we can see. Um, when they're, so for example, with the, the work in the Balkans that I've been involved with, um, I've seen some really uh, impressive and I think you know, very important um, uh, models where even though projects might be started by uh, external actors, there's a very, very much an assets based, the, the strong projects tend to work from a, a position of, of working with local strengths and also really handing over um, responsibility and authorship to to those groups, um, uh, not at a time when it's when when it's right. And I think that there is always a question in these projects about when that time is. There isn't necessarily a hard and fast rule for that. Um, and in fact, in some of the research I did in, in Mostar, that that was a point of division between different people. You know, at what point did the international people hand over? Was it too soon? Were they staying too long? Were they? Um, uh, making money out of this crisis and, and you know, um, improving their careers and, and not actually uh, making enough of a difference in people's lives or did they hand over at the right time and really offer opportunities for, for local people to be able to take these projects and, and turn them into and shape them into what it was that made sense for them. And, uh, and obviously when that happens, um, the projects have far greater longevity. Um, that's that's thinking about them in terms of the ethics of, of doing the work. Um, 
what Thank was the other you, part? Lily. I think <laughs> I think that's, that's it's really useful to to think about um, those sorts of questions, as you said, in terms of community ownership. Um, and thinking about working from an asset-based position and working from a strengths-based position. And I think that's where music uh, research can maybe offer broader sorts of social programs, some really interesting ways of thinking about starting from a position of strength or mapping the cultural assets of, of a community um, and not going in thinking that just because a community might have social challenges that it's, it, it's deficient of, of culture and music, which of course we know is an absolute nonsense. So I think your comments really point towards that. And I'd like to invite Charu maybe to reflect a bit on some of the co-design processes that you really highlighted in your presentation, um, building on what Gillian's just um, offered. Yeah, so I had two challenges. One was the disciplinary design building with the midwives because they speak a very scientific language. For them, um, I was asked how I'm going to evaluate the program, what I'm going to measure, how I'm going to measure it, what the data is going to look like, and very technical things from them. And I sat down with them and said, um, we will sit down with the ladies and they will tell us what they want to give us. We will work with what they are ready to share. And when they are ready to share, if the 12 weeks go on with no one wanting to share anything, that's fine too. We offer a space and we offer facilitation and some music. Um, and the other challenge on the, uh, one was the disciplinary challenge and the other, but, but they had their own things as well, which I kind of agreed to and all of that. The other challenge was really talking to the women. So there were women who wouldn't make eye contact with me or with anyone else in the beginning. Um, just they would just talk to their midwife, they would come and they would just rock the baby, hold it very close, talk to the midwives. And while singing, they would watch other people sing, but they would not participate. But as the weeks progressed, they started opening up, conversations started happening. Um, and so the core design was, was the, the long, the, the protracted period of relationship building, uh, months prior to the beginning, but also the design had to be improvised in situ. So I think the most important thing in community participatory projects is as researchers being open to the fact that things will not go according to our plan, but they will have to be flexible and responsive to the culture that we seek to serve. Thank you, Chari. That's that's a really lovely concrete way of, of thinking about the ways in which you negotiate not only the design of a project, but also your positionality, I guess, as a researcher or a facilitator uh, in the space. And I like the non-participation option as well. So if the women decided they didn't want to participate, we know that non-participation can actually be a great sign of agency when you, you decide whether you want to participate or not. I come from the field of community music which is very focused on participation, but of course, non-participation is, is sometimes an act of resistance that has great agency to it. Thinking about um, working in a health related context or, or with midwives brings me to my next um, chestnut, I guess, which is the good old um, tired and true maybe debate between the intrinsic and the instrumental benefits and value of music making. And I think, um, you know, yes, we've heard these debates going on in cultural policy for decades, and we all have our positions that we've reached on them. But I find the more I work in this space with other arts organizations and across sectors, these are not resolved issues. Um, when I'm working on some recent projects with the social sector, they are looking at music in highly instrumentalized terms, in terms of what it's going to do to benefit a particular agenda, whether it's you know, a health agenda or a parenting agenda or an educational agenda. And it seems to me there's still a lot of work we've got to do in terms of shifting the conversation. So it's not just about music in these highly instrumentalized terms, but really finding ways of showing how the intrinsic and the instrumental are so related. Now I'm looking at you on screen and I know you've all written about this. 
and written about the way that music's intrinsic value is what makes it so wonderful instrumentally and that they're not necessarily two separate things but one of the same coin but different sides and I wondered whether we could maybe open this up because it doesn't seem to have resolved itself when you look at the practice happening in the field and I wondered if anyone wanted to jump in on their take around how they are thinking about this sort of intrinsic um, instrumental kind of division that still seems to pervade um, our field. I'm throwing really simple, straightforward questions tonight. I, I understand. Maybe somebody we haven't heard from yet. Maybe Tris Nasari or Mariko or Alex, do you want to chime um, in on that? Yeah, I'm willing to have a go at this one. Um, I'm, I'm going to come at it from a um, education policy perspective because this is the context that I'm more familiar with this kind of what I call a false dichotomy between the intrinsic and extrinsic benefits. Um, and I think in the educational context, I think sort of sticking to those sticking to those categories and trying to define it in those categories has actually done a disservice because it's kind of, um, uh, I guess, sort of, what's the word I'm looking for? It's sort of removed those instrumental benefits. I mean, if you think about the idea, the argument that you know, in school, we are going to use music because it, help, it helps improve maths and it helps improve English. Um, well, then we have subjects for maths and English. So why are we going to use music for that? You know, the, that argument quickly begins to sort of fall over. Um, and I think personally, a much better way to think about it is to kind of think about the idea that actually through music, and this kind of links back to that idea about why music. Um, personally, I think that through music, we can access so much. So, I mean, you know, through a musical act, you know, we can, you know, we can make friends, we can learn about something, we can learn about ourselves, you know, we can, you know, regulate our own uh, emotion or any of that sort of stuff. So um, I think to sort of, I think it's more useful to kind of look at it in that holistic way and what it can do, all the different things that it can do for us instead of trying to separate it into, you know, this is what it's going to achieve for us, you know, in this way and what it's going to achieve for us in that way. I hope that made some semblance of sense. Absolutely. Thanks, Alex. I think there's a lot of, of nodding with, 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 with us in terms of agreeance and great to hear it in an educational context as well. Marika, you've popped your hand up. We'd love to hear your thoughts. I hope my connection is stable enough so that you can hear me. Can you hear me? Okay, great. Yeah. Uh, I've been thinking about the music as a sustainable and a permeable resource. You know, in my in my career, in, in my PhD, I was looking at the music used in dementia care, where the people with dementia and their care are joined in the singing activity, and then what kind of benefit that they receive sustainably throughout their you know their life with dementia. And I've been you know we've been thinking about the online musicing, how music can be also a sustainable resource for this online musicing and how it can be permeable resource, resources. And then we've been, I've been thinking about this and then I thought like one aspect is that it's, it's limited what we can receive, of course, but uh, I think because many people are participating from their home and in their everyday life, it's some, sometimes I feel like it can permeate into their everyday life even more. And then they kind of collect the resources from their own everyday life. And then that's one thing. And they're also sustainable in a way that uh, people with a physical disability, even after the uh, I mean, COVID you know, period ends, and then for the people who are apart can join in. So I thought it can uh, introduce the new form of community music kink through the online music kink. Thank you so much, um, Mariko. And I really like your idea of a sustainable resource. And that really reminds me of, of wonderful work in music therapy around a resource oriented approach. And I think that uh, ties back quite nicely to our conversation earlier about working from a strengths based cultural assets point of view, rather than damage centered sorts of, of, of lenses and, and, and maybe theories of change. So, so thinking about working in 
and across different sectors. Um, I'm really interested in this space for the field of SIM more broadly. If we're thinking about grappling with big social issues like many of our SIM colleagues are and like many of the symposium sessions have, have talked about, uh, we're talking about working with a variety of sectors from corrections to education to, to health and, and the broader social sector. In Australia, where there are really big social issues being tackled, uh, there's a very big focus on place-based approaches and what we call collective impact approaches where multiple sectors come together, multiple parts of the community who wouldn't customarily work together to tackle the issues collectively rather than in silos. And I know this is not just unique to Australia, this is happening across the world. But my issue with this is that musicians seem to so rarely be invited to the table or if they are, it's after, uh, an afterthought or uh, it's because somebody knows somebody that you're invited to the table late. It's really striking to me that musicians rarely seem to be integrated into the backbone of these sorts of bigger social initiatives. And if they are integrated, it's always to bend towards the bigger social agenda rather than musicians bringing to the table their unique methods and approaches and ways of working that might inform these other sectors. I don't know if this is just me in the work that I've been doing, that I've experienced this. I'd be interested to know uh, your thoughts on, on how we find productive ways as musicians to work across sectors where we're not bending to an another, another agenda, but we also have the capacity to translate why music and why music is important. Is this something that has any resonance with the panel members um, and they'd like to chime in with their thoughts on how we negotiate this complex cross-sector work that we find in SIM? Um, I'm, I'm happy to jump in on that one to start us off because one of the things that um, I think it, is music is very effective in is that it is, very, it is a very flexible way of working. And, and the changes that it brings about can be very small but significant. So I actually think it's it's a good partner in a collective impact model because um, because the likelihood is is that it's a, we're going to be making a contribution to a, a larger change, but not necessarily being the the driver of that larger change. In fact, lots of the changes that that music and musicians and uh, music making can be effective in, I think, are these sort of slow. Uh, 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 accruals of, of, of small micro changes. Um, and, it, and in a way this connects back the, what I started to think about while we were talking about the instrumental intrinsic dichotomy, um, that when we look, when we move ourselves away from the, uh, from the large claims and start to focus on the tiny, the micro changes that, that can be taking place, then perhaps we can put a bit of distance between ourselves and, and worrying about whether something is intrinsic or in, instrumental, but in fact, this is just music. Humans make music because it works um, on, our, on our flourishing in so many um, complex ways that to try to separate them out, it doesn't necessarily make very much sense. Um, yes, I'll leave it there, thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Gillian. And that is the favourite topic of conversation Gillian and I have talked about on many occasions in terms of acknowledging those small changes uh, rather than grand sweeping, you know, notions of change that might happen in music. And sometimes it's the accumulation or an archipelago of, of changes that music might bring about that makes it so powerful. And that reminds me in terms of, of looking for those small changes that accumulate over time. Tia, your work in terms of thinking about slow or slow sociology or slow scholarship and your work with um, Gary Ansdell in terms of really advocating for ethnography that really makes space for those sorts of things to occur where the process is important rather than just a pre and post kind of quick measure that misses all of these micro moments that are so significant. Um, just very briefly, because I know we're going to run out of time. Yes, it's something that also um, Mariko and I have worked on together and where she was the lead author and there's a chapter called The Goodness of Small Changes. And it's highlighting how we really need a very different kind of parodying, not only of how to assess music's impact, but also a very different ontology of what it means to be uh, healthy, and I'm not talking about well-being. I'm talking about you know physiological issues as well. 
Um, and I think that we have been, uh, Gary and I wrote in a piece called What Can't Music Do? Um, we've often been blinded by the very over bright clinical light that asks us to think about everything that music can contribute in terms of measurables and deliverables. And we haven't thought enough about the other side of it, which is the so-called user experience. And I think actually, if we look to Norway at the moment as a model, I think it's just fabulous to see how increasingly there are um, options to take non-pharmaceutical uh, forms of therapy, music therapies offered now, as it were, on their national health. Uh, it's very exciting because it's in, it's implying also a really different paradigm of operating and understanding health. And I think what's really hopeful there is it's opening up for us the understanding of health as something emergent and flexible itself and as something that takes shape in relation to people and environments. And then that inevitably comes back to your question about ethics that you posed earlier, because inevitably then environments are political and they have, con they have um, implications for health consequences. So, yeah. Yeah, and if I could just butt in, Bridie, I wouldn't mind flipping that, that issue back to you and just talking to us a little bit about your work with First Nations people in Australia where there's a different kind of cultural construction to the Western European concept of um, art and what it's used for and um, that sense of everyday life and well-being. I don't know if you want to comment on that because that seems to be really important to me. Sure. Thanks, Jane. And, and in terms of reflecting and thinking of time spent in those sorts of contexts uh, with First Nations communities, what Tia has just described is a beautiful articulation of that, uh, which is seeing everything in far more holistic terms rather than that bright clinical light, which tends to be so reductionist. And if there's anything that I've learned from all of those years of work, it's about the inter interconnectivity of things and how relational everything is and so when we're starting to think about music and culture um, we, our current work is thinking about it as a music as a, um, a cultural determinant of health we have that much broader holistic view of these sort of conceptualizations and how everything connects and that allows for those small moments I think it shows those small moments um, as part of a much larger picture so so thank you, Jane, um, for, for throwing that back to me. And thank you, um, Tia and others for their thoughts on that. Tris Nassari, I'm mindful we haven't given you too much airtime. And I wondered before we begin to close this panel part of the discussion, if you'd like to make any reflections on what we've just said from, from your experiences of this research. Um, well, I come to the research with a background in community psychology. And so the discussion around sort of the clinical uh, lens is really interesting to me because while clinical psychology definitely does take that perspective, community psychology is quite interested in the social ecological context. Um, so absolutely, I think music is a beautiful model for that sort of study and certainly that's, that's what our research has found, that it's relational. It's not uh, something that you can break into discrete constructs. Beautiful. I think that's an excellent way to, to finish our panel part of the discussion. And thinking of relational terms, I'm mindful we've had 60 odd colleagues on the call with us, uh, in community with us, listening in interesting ways, maybe uh, doing the washing, having dinner, having a morning coffee, taking the dog for a walk, uh, getting kids ready for school, whatever it might be. And it would be lovely to now open up the discussion more broadly and to hear some of their questions. We have such an incredible panel here. So I have no doubt that there are some questions that people would like to pose to this wonderful Brains Trust. So I'm going to hand it back over to Lucas, who's going to guide us through some of these questions. Well, I didn't, um, Bridie, I didn't want to interrupt uh, the this very interesting discussion that you had. Um, and 
we only have a few minutes left now for a Q&A, but it's it's okay because uh, you, uh, I, I, I saw you touch upon uh, most of the the, the, the the things that were comments and the questions that, that came up. Um, let me propose one uh, which is uh, which has not been as such touched upon. It's from uh, Kim Buskov. Um, he um, he would like to to ask Jillian uh, the following question. Uh, Jillian, you describe music as a tool for achieving a pra pragmatic everyday peace in which conflicts can be avoided, but you also noted how this strategy might allow social inequalities to be reproduced. Uh, I've uh, Kim Kim says uh, writes. Uh, I find this tension to be very interesting and important. What do you think? This tells us about music. Mm. Thank you so much for the question, Kim. Um, so, I just just to clarify, the the everyday piece is not necessarily created by the music, but through the whole project. So, the activities and 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 how they have been set up and and the context in which they're working. I think it's interesting that um, as I've started to look at varieties of piece, the way that they reflect. Um, the wider social environment. I don't know yet, because this is quite an, an early in, um, line of inquiry for me. I don't know how, if that's going to be something that's very consistent across many different projects. But in the two examples I shared, um, it certainly was a consistency. Um, I, I think what it tells me about music is that it's of how much of a, it's a social practice it is. A social, it's so grounded in, in who we are as, as a social group. Um, and as a cultural group. So it's not surprising that they that it will then um, bring forth these tensions. I think my interest in in that these different possibilities is is about the goals of the project itself. Um, so if there's a particular uh, kind of piece that is in mind, then that it might be contradicted at so, on some level somewhere within the practices, I think is something interesting for us to think about as practitioners um, so that we are creating work that has a coherence to it. Um, and if I think about the Sri Lankan project where there was this reproduction of, uh, or mirroring if you like, of, of what um, is essentially the, a, a current di social dynamic or power dynamic within Sri Lankan society post-war. Um, there was, there were various layers where that wasn't going on. And there were various reasons that had nothing to do with the music but to do with um, organizational matters or logistic matters where things kind of went wrong, there was this cascade that meant that became the default, that became the norm that nobody seemed to mind, that this group was being given less and less space in which to, to be a collaborator in this project. Um, and the extent to which they may have internalized that as an expectation was also something that I wondered, um, again, as an outside observer looking at this project. Um, and the everyday peace idea, I think, is interesting that it is it doesn't have that transformational element to it. That that's not necessarily the purpose. But there are music and peace building projects that that do aim to bring a confrontation, if you like, in a, in some safe way, to to for people to grapple with the difficulties of living in a conflicted environment and and the ways that that might enter the musical space. So. A long answer, but I think the short answer is that it's that it, it it depends on so many of these factors that the music is one element um, and a very important element for bringing people together, but it can go in a lot of different directions from that point. Uh, let me let me ask one last question. Uh, pick up uh, one last question. Um, uh, we have different questions about um, the the longer term impact of uh, music making. Um, 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 George, Georgia Nicolaou um, uh, would like to ask uh, Charu, Charu Mani, uh, whether you followed the the women after the project and 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 what happened to 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 them afterwards and what uh, in 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 what sense. Uh, uh, the music music had 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 an impact on on their lives, and uh, uh, yeah. so there are several Thanks. people asking these questions, the questions of uh, the the follow up and uh, the longer term impact of music making. 
Yes, thank you, Lucas. So this speaks also to methodology through which we connected with the women through the project, before the project and after. Um, so the women who were willing to give us their numbers were contacted through WhatsApp because a lot of them didn't have access to email or computers, but they all had phones and they all had WhatsApp um, through which they kept contact with their parents and families back home. So WhatsApp was very important to them. And so the port of contact was, was WhatsApp. Um, and um, after the life of the project, which was 12 weeks as pilot, we uh, do stay in touch. I wish them for the new year. And some of them sent me pictures of their newborn babies. Uh, those who were pregnant gave birth. And so um, a few milestones were reported. It was lovely, um, but I'm seeking further funding uh, through which to uh, perpetuate and continue the workshops and thereby build uh, a greater sense of community, bring, in, bring newer people inside, but also create a space for older members to come and join and make more friends, stay connected with their midwives and therefore um, have a wraparound community kind of a, an effect, uh, a ripple effect, yes. Thank you. Yes, so Bridie, I think we will need now um needs to go on to the to closing the session um, stay with us uh, all of you but uh, before closing this session um, we can now listen and see a short six minute video of music proposed by the brussels fun for kids uh, a fine example of a social music project involving kids and youngsters from very different horizons jan ockerman i hope you're out there jan uh, of the organization METICS can tell us what we will be seeing in the coming minutes. Jan? Yes, hello everybody. Uh, happy to join you uh, to end uh, this session. Um, I'm representing uh, or presenting to you the FANFA Kids, which is a youngster percussion group uh, featuring kids and teenagers uh, between 6 and 16 years old. Uh, all living in, uh, in Brussels. Um, their music or, or their groove, their sound, it's uh, a kind of mix of uh, different genres uh, that uh, the kids grow up with in uh, popular Brussels neighborhoods like uh, Molenbeek or uh, Les Marolles. Uh, what's special about them also is that the kids, they get coached by professional musicians uh, who teach them uh, rhythms and other musical influences from uh, continents like Africa, Latin America, but also Europe. And on their turn, uh, the youngsters, they uh, lead the band during concerts, so there's no like uh, professional artist uh, guiding them at the concerts, they're on their own. And the kids, they also teach the rhythms to other kids via workshops in youth centers, in different schools uh, and partner organizations. Uh, I'll maybe end by saying the origins of the FANFA kids, in fact, they have been created in 2000 uh, during the first Zineke Parade, which uh, maybe certain of you uh, have already heard about. It's a, a massive biannual community arts parade, uh, gathers a lot of people here in Brussels. Um, and ever since, the project of FANFA kids has been managed via collaboration between Centrum West, De Bruy, which is a youth center in Molenbeek, and METIX, the music prediction house where I work. Uh, this synergy between a social and an artistic partner makes the group uh, more than alive uh, after 20 years of existence. They recently had a new look, a new uh, repertoire, a new uh, recording sessions also, and hopefully in the future, uh, lots of new concerts and also international ex exchanges with groups abroad. Um, i let you now enjoy the vibe of the FAMFA kids.
Thank you to the FAMFA kids who succeeded to make this little film, even though it was not easy during uh, COVID times. It's uh, so good to end this session in their presence. Uh, thanks, really. Thank you also to Alex, Alexander Cook, uh, Mariko Hara, Tia Denora, Jane, Jane Davidson, uh, Trisna Sari Fraser, Gillian Howell, Charu, Charu Lata Bani, and Bridey, Bridey Bartlett for your precious contributions today. Interesting discussion. And um, next week, Tuesday, the 23rd of February, Grasa Mota will chair a second session on what makes musicians want to engage themselves in social music projects, what they expect from it and what their needs are in terms of accompaniment. We already had a first session on this topic on uh, the 19th of January, then chaired by Ande Biskop. Also, next week's session will be in the morning, our morning, starting at 10 a.m. Uh, Central European time. This will again allow our friends and colleagues from Asia to be with us um, uh, without having to stay up late at night. If, if you listen to our SIM podcast, you can this week find a new episode introducing next week's session, including interviews with uh, musicians from Portugal, Australia, Belgium, as, a, as well as from Gaza in Palestine. After today, we still have three more symposium sessions planned. You can find all the details on the, on the websites of SIM and of Bozar. I hope you will be with us again these coming weeks. Bring your friends and colleagues. Bye.